is talking about microevolution, which, interestingly, um, microevolution, when, when evolution was first described by Charles Darwin and Alfred Russell Wallace, was the controversial aspect of it. Macroevolution was accepted. And now it tends to be the reverse. Even most creationists will accept microevolution. But it's the next phase that they have problems with, macroevolution. This is where we're looking at speciation, and I want to introduce you to the idea of tree thinking, using phylogenies to represent a macroevolutionary pattern, which is, which is really one of the biggest things that people that don't understand evolution um, are confused about. And then, once we kind of get the, the a primer of evolution, I want to talk about how I have approached people that are kind of wary about evolution, since I've been teaching this for 17 years in East Texas. You know, every semester I get students that I can see it in their eyes, you know, that mixture of fear and, and loathing and, and, uh, uh, and, and if you approach it right, oftentimes you can kind of get past that. Not always, but, but often. And then kind of give you some, some examples when you're discussing evolution with people, how, you know, what, what is the evidence for evolution? And then we'll get to our God's Advocate Q&A portion, which I think is, is going to be a lot of fun. Hopefully you are looking forward to that. Okay, let's well, first talk about microevolution. Microevolution is evolution within species. So what's going on genetically and morphologically within a species, maybe multiple populations within a species, but it's at that level. And so here's kind of my simple cartoon version of that. So we have generation one. We have a population of rabbits that are representing the gene pool, and the typical phenotype, the phenotype is the physical manifestations of the genes. Okay, so the, the, I mean, the genotypes are the genes themselves, the phenotypes are what are expressed by the genotype. And so they're all white rabbits, and so we have this white rabbit as a typical phenotype. Well, maybe the next generation, we have a dark rabbit. Okay, now that dark rabbit can come up, up about in two different ways that we'll talk about here in a minute. And maybe in the subsequent generation, you see that the, the frequency in the gene pool of the dark rabbits is increasing, so that now the typical phenotype, you can't say it's one or the other. Both are, are pretty much evenly represented. And perhaps in future generations, this phenotype is going to go to fixation, so that it's the only phenotype in the population. So that's a really simple example of evolution that, that could encompass all four of these evolutionary mechanisms. Now, the, the primary ones you're probably familiar with, and really the most important for talking about adaptive evolution, are natural selection and mutation. So, mutation is one of the ways that this dark rabbit could have come back, right? So the genes that originally produced white rabbits ended up producing a different phenotype because of mutation. Um, but that mutation could have actually occurred in a different population, and this rabbit could have popped over to this population from another population. We call that gene flow. So gene flow and mutation do similar things. Mutations are the ultimate source of genetic variation, but a mutation that occurs in one population can get into another population through gene flow. Natural selection is what can explain the increase in the dark phenotype. Perhaps climate change, you know, this was snowshoe hair, and with snow melt, uh, it was more beneficial for a darker phenotype to be better camouflaged. That, that ecological context, that change, has made this phenotype what we call selectively advantageous, meaning the darker phenotype is now an adaptation for this changed environment. Or it could have just been totally random. Okay? That's where genetic drift comes in. We'll talk a little bit about genetic drift, but Genetic drift takes several lectures to really get down. That's a really complex issue. Okay, well let's first talk about natural selection. There are three things that are crucial for natural selection to be able to work. And the first is, you have to, I mean, natural selection is what we call differential survival and reproduction. Well, for something to be differential, there has to be variability. Individuals have to differ in some regard. So, I'm going to give you a real example of uh, the medium ground finches, which is one of the Darwin's finches on uh, Daphne Major Island in the Galapagos. And in the population, there's some of these individuals that have a relatively deep bill, large bill. And it turns out, if you study these birds ecologically, the large billed individuals tend to prefer eating large seeds. That's where, where they're most efficient at getting calories or unit effort. Okay? 
And so that's, that's the adaptation uh, in this case. But there are other individuals in the population that have relatively small bills, uh, much less tall bills. And these are the individuals that are actually doing fairly well on small seeds. Okay, so our first prerequisite for natural selection work is there. You have to have variation in the, in the population. Not everybody can be the same. The other thing for this to have any evolutionary importance is it has to, it has, that phenotype has to be based on genes. So there has to be a link between the genotype and the phenotype. And one of the ways that you can test that is by doing a heritability study in which you compare the parent's kind of mean bill size. We call this the mid-parent value. And does that have a, a, a predictable relationship with the offspring's bill depth? And so what you can see here is both of these lines show a very nice positive relationship. So big build parents give rise to big build kiddos. Small build parent give rise to small build kiddos. Now it didn't have to be that way. It could have been that you do this kind of study and it's just kind of randomly distributed. And maybe what you find out is that big build individuals get big bills because they just get better diets. And so it can be all environmentally determined. And if that's the case, natural sex you can't do anything with that. But this is actually showing us that, that the genes associated with the parents are being contributed to the offspring. Okay, so that's our pre second prerequisite for natural selection to be work. The third component is, and this is the most important one, there has to be what we call differential fitness. And Peter uh, and Rosemary Grant, uh, both professors at uh, Princeton University, have studied the Darwin finches for decades now. And when you study a, a species for long periods of time, you get grand opportunities to find discoveries like this. In 1977, there was a, a severe drought in the Galapagos Islands. And what that did is it, it negatively impacted the growth of, of plants producing small seeds. So as the season progressed, all the remaining seeds that were left were just larger and larger. That was just all that was, was left over. That gave a huge advantage to the large bill individuals. That's one aspect of differential fitness. These large bill individuals had higher survivorship. That's one aspect of natural selection. They were naturally selected because of this filtering mechanism. They had the right tools, in this case their, their bill size, met the ecological challenge posed by the large seeds that were available. And this is the data to actually show that. This is 1976. The, the cool thing about this study is this is a really small island and the grants had the capability to catch every single individual in this population. So most, you know, when I do studies of birds, I go out and catch 40 birds that is hopefully a representative of the population. They can catch up to 2,000 birds a year, catch all of them in the population. So they know exactly what the genetic makeup of the population is. And this is, shows you the distribution. You have a few individuals with giant bills, quite a few individuals, most individuals with medium bills and some with small bills. But if you look at the mean represented by this little arrow here, <coughs> in 76, I mean in 67, before the drought, it was, you know, a little, a little under nine and a half. And here after the drought, the 1978 survivors, it's shifted off just the other side of 10. That's evolution. Not a lot of evolution, right? We're just talking about a change in the relative makeup of the phenotype, in this case, the bill sign. But it makes sense with regard to the ecological challenge that these birds face. As I mentioned, this is just one aspect of differential fitness. Given that these individuals had greater survivorship, they're also going to contribute more to the next generation as far as reproduction. And so we also see that there was differential reproductive success, so that if you look at the makeup of the offspring that were born in the year before the drought, this is their average bill length, and you can see that it's larger in the year after the drought. So those two aspects have changed the population, both genetically and phenotypically, due to this environmental challenge. That's what we call natural selection. So in this context, a big bill is an adaptation. It gives the individuals that have that trait uh, an advantage for both survival and reproduction. But the cool thing is, if you do a long-term study, you keep 
track of these birds, you're eventually going to have different circumstances. And in 83, it was a reverse situation. Just pouring rains, drowned out all the plants that produced the large seeds, and there was a huge boom of, of plants producing small seeds. And guess what happened? In 84, we see a shift in the population to 2.5% smaller bit. So the direction of the filter has changed, and now smaller bills are the adaptation. So talking about a, a trait being an adaptation doesn't make sense unless you put it into the proper ecological context. And that's something I think a lot of people uh, don't understand about natural selection. Now, as I just illustrated, natural selection is a non-random process. If you know what that ecological challenge is, you can predict how the population is going to change in the future. This is one of the things that drives me crazy when you hear people critiquing evolution and say, well, how can all this biological diversity come about through random evolution? This is not a random process. This is a non-random process that you can make predictions about how the population is going to change if you know the ecological circumstances. Okay, so let's move on to mutations. Mutations, as I mentioned, are the ultimate source of that genetic variation on which natural selection can do something. It's the raw material on which evolution acts. Mutations, totally random. Absolutely random. I mean, there, there's no indication that organisms, you know, a few years ago we had really horrible droughts here. And you, the, the pine trees, which kind of suffered the most from that, they can't sit there and say, wow, you know, that was a really bad year. I think it's going to be that kind of way in the future. Let's really work hard and mutate our cells to produce gametes that give our offspring some ability to uh, survive droughts. It just doesn't work that way. Mutations come about, some of which are good, some of which are, most of which are bad or neutral. So let's just quickly review how <coughs> mutations occur. Most mutations occur when DNA is being replicated. Okay, so here we have a DNA molecule with the, kind of the functional units are the, the four nitrogenous bases, A, G, C, and T. And T always bonds with A and G always bonds with C. I say always, except when something goes wrong. Okay, so if you see when you're making a new piece of DNA, you're using half of the old as a template. New pieces of nitrogenous bases come in to make a new DNA chain. Okay, and so you're going to end up getting a, a new product that should be a mirror image of the one that you started with. But look what happened right here. Okay, a is supposed to bond with T. Okay, that A right there is bond with a C. That's an example of a mutation. Now, what's the consequence of that? Well, this is, this is how DNA gets its information transferred into something that's, that's biologically usable. In, in, in uh, reality, what they're doing is, doing is producing protein. <coughs> so you start off with a DNA. You have this sequence of nitrogenous bases. It goes through a process called transcription, where it writes that into a different language called messenger RNA. But the end product is a protein, which is these specific amino acids that are being called for by each three-letter word, which is called a codon, and they're kind of color-coded here. So if you have a DNA that says CAA, it's saying, give me valine. Okay? If it's got CGT, it's saying, I want alanine. And so the specific sequence in DNA is saying, I want this specific sequence of amino acids. And that's going to affect the functionality of the protein potential. Now, sometimes, especially in the third position, you change that A to, say, a T, oftentimes it doesn't do anything. It's still going to give you valine. Okay? In that situation, it is a mutation, but it's what we call a neutral mutation. Okay? It's not going to have any evolutionary consequences. It's going to give you exactly the same protein. Okay? Oftentimes, when it does change the sequence of amino acids, it's not changing in a good way. Usually it re reduces the functionality or completely ruins the functionality of the protein. But in rare circumstances, the change is actually beneficial. And those are the things that natural selection can do something with. So I'll give you an example of, of how a single mutation can have a dramatic effect, one of the more famous ones. 
So a single non-synonymous, so a synonymous one would be a mutation that gives you the same protein. But a non-synonymous means it's going to give you a different amino acid, and it's going to change the protein somewhat. So a non-synonymous substitution in hemoglobin can cause sickle cell anemia. Okay. And it, it does so if it just changes a single amino acid out of 146 that makes the hemoglobin protein. This is what a normal red blood cell looks like. This is one that has two copies of the defective protein for production of hemoglobin. It causes this sickling of the cell, which causes lots of clogging in the capillaries and, and painful uh, problems in individuals that are homozygous <coughs> for this, meaning they have two copies of this defective allele. And so that's, that's a bad situation. Natural selection is going to eliminate individuals with this genetic disorder. They're going to have lower survival and lower reproduction. That's how natural selection works. But here's the interesting thing about this situation. Again, an adaptation or, or a bad trait, it's always environmentally context dependent. People living in the tropics that have to deal with malaria it's actually good to have one copy, not two copies. Two copies is still bad. But if you're a carrier, if you have one copy of the sickle cell gene, it doesn't do this too much. Occasionally, it'll collapse one of these. But usually, you don't have too much symptoms associated with sickle cell anemia. But when that, it does collapse those, it's when the parasite that causes malaria has invaded these red blood cells. And basically, what that does is it filters those parasites out. and so. Individuals with a single sickle cell allele are resistant to malaria and have higher survivorship. Okay? So in that circumstance, having one sickle cell allele is actually an adaptation. Okay, so I just went through there talking about really simple mutations where you can just get a, a different version of the same gene. We call those different alleles. But in some cases, you can create entirely new pieces of DNA, new genes entirely. And this can come from a variety of sources, primarily what we call gene duplication. In the process of making gametes in meiosis, the chromosomes come together and they pair and they swap segments. And usually when they swap segments, they're, they're again, you're, they're uh, switching parts that are equal in size. Okay, so if these letters represent different genes, when these two chromosomes, two duplicated chromosomes, come together and swap segments, they should swap an A for an A and a B for a B, wherever they swap. They don't swap all entirely, but they just swap kind of randomly. But see, what's happened here is they've lined up unevenly. And the consequence of that is this copy, this piece of DNA, chromosome, is going to lack the C gene. And what is natural selection going to do that? Probably eliminate that individual if that C gene produces some really important protein. But the other piece got two copies of the C. Okay? We call this gene duplication. And then some interesting things can happen in evolutionary context. This extra copy can become non-functional. That happens a lot. In that case, we would call it a pseudogene. It gets a mutation that makes it not work anymore, but it's no big deal because they've got a backup copy. Okay? So it kind of allows them to, to uh, have mu absorb mutations without having any phenotypic effect. Or it can just stay the same, and whatever that protein was going to be used to make, it can just make double the amount, or it can make it faster. And so if it's a, you know, something that helps you metabolize sugars faster, or starches, or, or fats, it may make those individuals more efficient, so that could be an adaptation. Or, in some cases, they can form entirely new functions. Okay? And that's what can really drive evolution in, in large part. So here's an example of kind of that, that middle example. If you look at the Amy1 gene, this is a, a gene that helps in starch digestion. And if you look at different populations of humans that have different histories of having starch as important components of their diet, those populations have larger numbers of these genes that have occurred and been maintained through gene duplication. Populations of humans that don't have much starch in their diet have fewer copies. And if you compare it to our closest non-human relative, chimpanzees, they only have two copies, or in some populations, they don't have any functional copies at all. Okay? 
So it can show you how gene duplications can increase the amount of DNA and be adaptive if they're in the appropriate circumstance. Okay. Now we're going to go to the biggest scale. Sometimes instead of just copying one gene, you can copy your entire suite of chromosomes. We call this polyploidization. So most animals and plants and fungi, I can only say that with plants, a lot of animals and plants fungi are what we call diploid. They have two copies of each chromosome type. They're 2F. But if they get duplicated through polyploidization, they can be 4N, 8N, you know, they can be tetraploid, octopoid. And this is typically due to some really big meiotic error when they're producing gametes. Instead of them separating, they just all stay together and then they go into one gamete. So one egg gets no DNA and one egg gets all the DNA, all the copies. So that's kind of what's shown here with this plant. So the, the gametes that are produced are 2N and 2N, and if this, and this is actually really common in plants, and that's why I kind of pause, a lot of plants are uh, tetraploid because they have the capability of selfing. Okay? If you have this process and you produce a diploid gamete, it's really hard to find anybody that you mate successfully with because everybody else is producing a single N, and if you get a 3N individual, they may live, but they can't reproduce because their gametes are all just trash. Okay? So really the only hope for an individual that, that produces a, a, a diploid gamete is to find an, a, a close relative that might also have this, but more likely just to sell. And so a lot of plants have the capability of having both male and female reproductive structures, and so they can produce individuals that are foreign. Now what's the consequence of this? Again, from an evolutionary point of view, does it, does it matter? Well, there's some really interesting patterns. As I mentioned, a lot of plants are tetraploid or octopoid. And these are the plants that are the most numerous on the planet. The angiosperms, the flowering plants. That they're the plants that you almost always see when you go outside. Well, is there a link there? Have they been so successful because of having this extra DNA that evolution can play with? The same thing, we look, here's the phylogeny for animals. <coughs> So we've got, you know, your tunicates and your lancelets, <coughs> really small groups, not very diverse. We had a gene, uh, a two gene duplication events right here, a fourfold increase at the base of the vertebrates. So if you look at the number of species of vertebrates there are compared to these other lineages just before this two, this fourfold du duplication of the uh, genome, much more diverse, many more species. So this gives us, again, some indication that when you get that extra DNA to play with, evolution can do some pretty cool things with it. Well, there's even one other case in which there was a subsequent duplication right here in the ray fin fishes, which is the biggest group of vertebrates. So vertebrates as a whole have done pretty good, but the group that's done the best has got even more DNA to play with. Okay, so that, that just kind of shows you how important large-scale mutations can be. Okay, just really quickly go through the two remaining mechanisms of gene flow. Again, gene flow is just movement of individuals or somehow they're alleles. You know, it can be pollen blowing or spores blowing from, from a fungus from one population to another. So it's as simple as this is a single species of snake, okay, and this population has a different morphology than here and there's different genes or different alleles that give them that color pattern as an individual slithers from this population over that one, boom, that's gene flow. Okay. Now, the consequence of that could be nothing immediately. Or, if this new genotype is going to be an adaptation for this environment, well then, that allele is going to increase in frequency in that population. So, gene flow itself doesn't do much. And mutation itself doesn't do much. But it's, it gives you that extra variation that natural selection can do something. And again, genetic drift. Genetic drift is random changes from generation to generation in allele frequencies due to a mathematical principle called sampling error. Okay? And, and the best, this is basically the biological version of if I flip a coin and I say, I'm going to flip this coin two times and get heads. I'll bet you I can do that 10 bucks. Mo I would hope that most of you would say, I I'm going to not bet on that, right? Because there's a decent chance I can flip a coin two times and get heads, right? That wouldn't be unheard of. I mean, the, 
the mathematical expectation is that I would get heads and tails, that you're going to get 50-50, because there's a 50% chance of getting heads or tails for each time you flip it. If I came up to you and said, I'm going to flip this coin a thousand times and get heads every time, you're taking that bet, right? I mean, as long as you get to pick the coin, right? Because you have a big sample size there. Ran, you know, unexpected things are unlikely to occur in a large sample size. So small population, so if a, if a hurricane comes through and kills 99% of a population, weird things can happen. Okay? Just at random. You know, a two by four, you know, if you've got a population of birds, some of them have green wings, some of them have red wings, two by fours flying through the air, they don't care what color your wings are when, they're, when they whack you upside down. Right? Okay, that's, that's the kind of stuff we're talking about with. So it can have an evolutionary impact. It, it reduces genetic diversity, like natural selection does, but in unpredictable ways. Okay, so now let's move from microevolution to what, in, in most cases, is more controversial to people that don't understand evolution, and that's macroevolution. Thinking about evolution above the species level. So macroevolution is long-term accumulation of what I just talked about happens generation to generation in microevolution. In diverging lineages, and this is the key that people don't understand how lineages can diverge to give us the amazing biological diversity that we have. So, the, the initial stages of that diverse, diversification and divergence is the process of speciation. For speciation to occur, you have to take a, a, a population that at one time was freely interbreeding. All individuals had the potential to mate with each other. They have access to, to all individuals in the population. And you somehow have to break that. You have to create reproductive isolation. And the most common way that reproductive isolation comes about is through geographic isolation. So here we have some snakes in a prairie. If the climate changes and the environment changes such and maybe fire is restricted from burning throughout uh, this one swath of the prairie, so forests prop, uh, prop up, and this is a, not a, a habitat in which these snakes can live, we have established a reproductive isolation barrier. Okay? So now this population of snakes here and this population of snakes here are experiencing different evolutionary histories. There are going to be different mutations that occur here, that occur here. There could possibly be different weather patterns here versus here. So there could be different natural selection processes going on. Maybe this population is significantly smaller than this one, in which case genetic drift is going to impact them more. So what's going to happen is maybe you get a mutation to produce a dark snake here. If that is selectively advantageous, natural selection is going to lead to an increase in that in the population where it may become fixed in this population. And the key to speciation is if the environment then changes again so that these, these snakes can come back together, if they don't reproduce anymore, bingo, we have new species. If they can still reproduce to some degree and the, the hybrid offspring are just as successful, well then they're going to converge back into a single species. Okay. The fascinating thing is a lot of people don't realize this is going on right now. If you want to get biologists arguing with each other, ask them what the definition of a species is. Okay? It's really, it's easy in some cases. Okay? You know, a northern mockingbird and a cardinal. Obviously, those are different species. Okay? You start looking at some species, you know, yellow shafted flicker, red shafted flicker. Well, they're considered one species now. Some people might say they're two different species. And that's because they're in the process of speciating. We're actually seeing speciation occur. Uh, in historical time. Now, there's another way, though, to look at speciation. And this is looking at it from a phylogenetic perspective. So we start off with our initial population down here on the bottom, and we're going to be looking at how this changes through time going from the bottom up. So this is older time down here. This is more recent time up here. And again, we have the same thing going on. Population separate, and now, even though they might be able to come back together again, they can't reproduce. We've got two different species. We represent that graphically like this. Some of you all have probably seen figures that look like this. This is basically a phylogenetic tree. 
And this is how we try to envision and encapsulate the information we know about how different lineages are related to each other in phylogeny. And we call this tree thinking. It's kind of a way of organizing how organisms are related to each other on a large scale. And this can be really powerful to help us understand evolutionary patterns. Here's one of the group of birds that I work on. These are the passerine buntings. And uh, this is the species that I, I work on here in East Texas, the painted bunting. And if you look at how these different species in this family are related to each other by looking at their genetics, you can see a very interesting thing about how it tells us about the pattern of, of their coloration evolution. All of these birds are really prominently blue. Okay, so blue is a really big part of their, their body, and that's a structural color. So that indicates that structural color is the ancestral state in this group. But then we see this kind of, you see the kind of browns that are in uh, parts of these birds right here? That's what we call fatal color. Okay, well, why do they all have that? Well, because they all got that from a common ancestor. Okay, this, these two species right here get this from this common ancestor. These birds have lots of yellows, oranges, and reds. Those are carotenoid colors. Did they independently evolve that? No. This phylogeny tells us that this common ancestor did that. So tree thinking helps us understand how things have changed through time, how organisms relate to each other, and how the characters that make up the differences between those organisms have evolved. And, and here's the thing that I, I hope to, to kind of get across. So the bottom of the tree represents the ancestral lineage. What does that lineage represent? It could represent a species, it could represent a genus, family, order, class, phylum, kingdom. And the descendants <coughs> are the ones that came after the reproductive isolation. So on a large scale, this phylogeny can have within it smaller scale phylogeny. Okay, so if this is different families of birds, for example, these might represent the different species that make up those families. That's why we can talk about phylogenies like this. This is a phylogeny just showing you the different vertebrates, okay, so the animals with the backbones. But realize within each of these white branches, there are smaller branches like that, showing how each of the individual species <coughs> are related within each of these major phyla and subphyla. And some lineages don't make it to the top. These are those that have gone extinct. And this is where a lot of people get confused. They think about transitional fossils or extinct fossil species. They say, well, where do they fit? On which of these branches do they fit? Well, in very rare circumstances would they be directly on one of these branches. What almost always they represent are little side branches that just never made it, okay, that, that ended up going extinct. But they do tell us the degree of relatedness between the lineages that they kind of uh, are represented in between. But to think about a tree, you have